Day two of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's landmark state visit to the U.S. began with an elaborate ceremonial welcome on the south lawns of the White House, a grand spectacle that saw scores of excited Indian Americans cheering the Prime Minister on. President Biden said India and the U.S. are two great nations, friends and powers that share democratic values and India-U.S. ties will define the 21st century. The two leaders then held talks on a range of bilateral and global issues. What followed were some big-ticket announcements. The one area that has seen the biggest breakthroughs and path-breaking deals is that of defense ties and technology cooperation. American giant General Electric and India's Hindustan Aeronautics Limited have signed an MOU to jointly produce fighter jet engines for the Indian Air Force with significant transfer of technology. It's being termed as a game-changer and a trailblazing initiative as this is the first time that the United States is sharing such technology with a non ally. Another major deal is on India procuring cutting-edge predator drones priced at $3.5 billion from an American company. These drones will substantially enhance Indian Armed Forces surveillance and strike capabilities. Leading American technology firm Micron will set up a $2.75 billion semiconductor facility in India. On quantum advanced computing and artificial intelligence, India and the U.S. have established a joint Indo-U.S. quantum coordination mechanism to facilitate joint research between the public and private sectors. India has also joined the Artemis Accords, a joint exploration of Moon and Mars. Also, H-1B visa rules have been tweaked and both nations will open new consulates. At a press conference following the bilateral talks, Prime Minister Modi was asked what India will do to improve the rights of religious minorities. Prime Minister Modi said, democracy is part of our spirit and blood. We live and breathe democracy. It's in our constitution. If there are no human values and human rights, there is no democracy. When we live and breathe democracy, there is no question of any discrimination. In a rare honour for a world leader and a first for an Indian leader, Prime Minister Narendra Modi subsequently delivered an address to a joint session of the US Congress, his second since 2016. The Prime Minister received multiple standing ovations during his address. Among a range of issues he talked about was terrorism, saying even two decades after 9-11 and a decade after 26-11, terrorism remains a pressing challenge. He added, terrorism is an enemy of humanity and there can be no ifs and buts in dealing with it. The Prime Minister's last engagement for the day was the state dinner, which was attended by eminent thought leaders, American CEOs, key members of the Indian American community and luminaries from the worlds of art, entertainment and fashion. The two leaders raised a toast to the India-US friendship. Given the host of path-breaking deals and a strong reaffirmation by both sides of their commitment to robust ties and an enduring friendship, can the India-US relationship truly emerge as the defining partnership of the 21st century? All right, let's now go across to former Indian ambassador to the US, Ambassador Nirupama Rao, who's with us on the show. Ma'am, let me begin by asking you, President Biden says, India and the US are two great nations, friends and powers with shared democratic values and the India-US ties will define the 21st century. Does this historic visit signal the cementing of a defining partnership in your view? Well, Neha, I think it is a very defining partnership between India and the United States. And the official state visit by Prime Minister Modi and all the outcomes that you have seen presented to all of us as a result of that visit signify a, a milestone. They signify to us that a stage has been reached in this, un in this relationship that uh, Kurt Campbell uh, you know, referred to a few weeks ago as escape velocity. We've reached that stage. And today, when we talk, I mean, I'm not talking of the pomp and circumstance surrounding the visit. I think that is certainly something we have all enjoyed seeing and have been greatly encouraged by the good vibes between both the, the leaders. But I think in terms of the outcomes, you look at technology. Critical and emerging technologies are now the pillar of this partnership. And the outcomes that you've seen in terms of defense and security, the agreement for the production of the GE F414 jet engines in India, enormously significant because what it means is that once all the 
you know, formalities are completed both on the US side and the Indian side, you are looking at the production of engines, jet engines that are going to power generations of Indian Air Force aircraft, at least, you know, for the foreseeable future. And I think that is enormously significant. It has never happened in India-US relations in the past. And for that matter, I think it really means a stepping up of the technological level that is available to our armed forces as they defend our country, as they defend our borders, as they defend the seas around us. Similarly, the, you mentioned the agreement on the MQ-9 predators or uh, drones which will be important for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance along our land borders and in the seas that surround us. And, and apart from that, the semiconductors, the agreement on semiconductors, on quantum, uh, you know, one of the things that have perhaps escaped uh, notice is the fact that India has now been admitted to the critical uh, minerals grouping that that had been formed last year. It's called the Mineral Security Partnership, and it will develop sustainable critical energy minerals supply chains universally. And that's very important for us because it's about critical minerals like lithium, cobalt, and graphite, which are needed for all the high technology production that you're talking of. So in to sum it up, I think this has been a very, very important visit. Uh, it's a it's a visit between two of our of the greatest democracies in the world. We all know that it's a visit that builds on the structure of relations that has been developed over the last decade and a half. I look back at 2005 and the agreement on civil nuclear cooperation. That was a great big breakthrough in this relationship, and one must not forget all the achievements of the past also, because all of them have contributed to what we see today. Absolutely. The civil nuclear deal, uh, nobody can question that it was a significant landmark in this bilateral relationship. Now, the one area, ma'am, that has seen the biggest breakthroughs and path-breaking deals, as you just mentioned, is that of defense ties and technology cooperation, the deal for the joint manufacture of GEF-414 fighter jet engines, and the significant transfer of technology that comes with it is being termed a trailblazing initiative because this is the first time that the United States is sharing such technology with a non-ally. They call it the crown jewel of their defense production. Do you believe this is indeed a game changer? I definitely think it's a game changer. And we'll have to look at how this deal gets implemented. So look beyond the joint statement, look beyond all the all that is being said about the outcomes of this visit and see how a few months and years down the line how these agreements are implemented because we we need action on the ground that's what's going to make a change so diplomacy has led us to this point and i think now it is incumbent on all the departments concerned on all the ministries concerned on both sides uh, the legislative appar apparatus uh, the rules and regulations, all that should fall into place so that we actually see the delivery of this change. All right. Uh, well, so clearly, uh, there is a lot to unpack here. Um, you know, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, some of uh, the other countries that may have figured in uh, these talks. There is no doubt that the U.S. is quite keen to wean India off its heavy dependence on Russian weapon supplies. With the U.S. finally opening the door of technology transfer for India, among other things, do you believe the U.S. has taken a big step forward in that direction? And even as India maintains that it will not compromise on its strategic autonomy, are we already witnessing a shift in a degree of disengagement with Moscow in the defense arena? Well, the Indian Defense Forces today still remain quite dependent on the Russian connection. If you look at all the three arms of our Defense Forces, the Army, the Navy and the Air Force, particularly the Navy and the Air Force, I think are dependent a great deal on the connection with Russia as far as defense equipment is concerned. Now, we've talked a long time about weaning ourselves off this Russian connection, even before the war in Ukraine. 
And I presume that process of weaning off will take place gradually, but it will be gradual. One must caution, you know, our audiences that it will be a gradual disconnect. And of course, Russia is today quite boxed in as far as the war in Ukraine is concerned. But for India, that connection with Russia is, is not easy to jettison. And it, it does have value for us too. Let us remember that this connection is not without its benefits for India. And you know, today, our relationship with Russia, it may be a legacy relationship, but remember that it's first and foremost going to take time to, for us to completely disengage from Russia. And I don't think that is the intention of the government either to effect that kind of you know, severance of relations with Russia, even as we build relations with the United States. And I think the United States understands our preoccupations, understands where we stand on these issues. And that, let me mention, Neha, is a measure of the maturity in our relations with, with the United States, the trust that exists, the understanding that exists. You're quite right. Uh, you know, uh, India has made it abundantly clear, especially in the last one year, that it does uh, intend to maintain its strategic autonomy. It's exhibited that with its uh, stand on Russia and Russian oil imports. Um, so, you know, let's now talk about another significant country, which most certainly would have come up in these bilateral talks. Um, in his address to the U.S. Congress, Prime Minister Modi said, and I'm quoting him, the dark clouds of coercion and confrontation are casting their shadow in the Indo-Pacific. The stability of the region has become one of the central concerns of our partnership. We share a, a vision of a free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific connected by secure seas defined by international law, free from domination. Now, there are clearly shared concerns between India and the US over China's growing aggression and revisionism. Do you think the US sees India as a countervailing force against China? Well, even two decades ago, I remember uh, Condoleezza Rice saying that India and the United States and that the United States needs to build its relationship with India because obviously referring to China, even before the estrangements in US-China relations had happened, she talked about India and the US maintaining that balance of freedom in the Indo-Pacific. She called it the Asia-Pacific at that time, but today, of course, the, the general acceptable term is the Indo-Pacific. So this is that balance of freedom. Now, without even mentioning China, it is obvious that there are strategic concerns that both India and the United States have about the actions of China in our region. For us in India, it is the actions of the Chinese on our land borders and that those actions are totally responsible, as I've said, for the degradation in our relations with China. We had for 30 years built a bilateral relationship that had maintained the peace on the line of actual control. But all that collapsed, as you know, with what happened in Galwan. And that land grab by the Chinese continues along the line of actual control. So we have our concerns. We have our concerns about China in our neighborhood. We have our concerns about China in the Indian Ocean. And the United States has also seen the deterioration of its relationship with China, the relationship that had been built up after the historic Nixon visit to China in 1972. That system, had, that relationship has also in many ways been degraded. And uh, we see a lot of tension between the two governments. Of course, uh, Secretary Blinken's visit there recently sought to introduce a measure of stability into the relationship. But it's, you know, it's a long, long haul, I, I can tell you. This will, the complications in US-China relations run very deep today. And there is a strategic competition between the two countries. And obviously, where India and the United States is concerned, you know, all this talk about the transfer of critical and emerging technologies to India, this new strategic technological partnership between India and the United States, and the defense and security partnership, you know, the transfer of technology where defense equipment is concerned, all this speaks of a cementing a great confluence, a strategic convergence between India and the United States vis-a-vis -vis China.
Absolutely. Ma'am, uh, you've not just been India's ambassador to the United States, you've also been former, you've also been foreign secretary of India. So who better than you uh, than to, uh, you know, uh, to, to answer this question? So let me ask you this. In the new world order, there seem to be two poles, the US and China. While they have intertwined economies, there's also this great power rivalry. Where does India figure in this complex geopolitical equation? Also, could Moscow's growing proximity to Beijing make New Delhi somewhat wary of Moscow going forward, despite the long-standing relationship the two enjoy, the one that you just referred to? Well, let me tell you that Russia pays a great deal of attention to India. The relationship from the Russian point of view, I'm talking from Moscow's point of view, is important for Russia. And that's been something that has been, uh, in a sense, a legacy from the Soviet days. And it hasn't really diminished to that extent. And both Mr. Modi and Mr. Putin enjoy a, a, a relationship which is very communicative. And I would say that, you know, where Russia and China are concerned, it's more a relationship of convenience today. And between India and Russia, I think it's a legacy relationship, but a, leg a relationship which has been a trusted one over the years. And I don't think it is in India's interest to sever the, that relationship, as I've said. Now, when it comes to how the US and India work out the future of their relationship, I'm sure there will be candid conversations from both sides about where each other's interests lie in regard to Russia, uh, you know, where the US is concerned, there are, there are huge tensions in the relationship with Russia today. But let me say, to answer your question about the two poles, as you called it, in world affairs today, you spoke of US and China. I would, uh, in a way, define the world differently. I would say that there are many poles in global affairs today. It's not just a bipolar world, even as, of course, if as a measure of power, if you are going to measure it according to power and influence, maybe it is the US and China who lead the pack. But Russia is a pole. Uh, India is definitely a pole. Uh, you know, we talk of ourselves as a leading power, but in terms of look at us chairing the G20 today and look at the work we are doing in the global south. Uh, Prime Minister Modi spoke to President Biden of how we would like the African Union to be part of the G20. So we are in many ways trying to represent to the developed world the voices of the south, as we call it today, the developing world. And I think in that sense, India, in it's the largest democracy in the world, country with the biggest population, poised to become the third largest economy in the world before the end of this decade. We are definitely a pole in global affairs today. So it's a multipolar world. And let us look at it that way. Not a bipolar world. Uh, the Cold War era is long over. This is a multipolar world. You know, it's very hard to move away from the subject of China, so I'll ask you one more question about that. Ties between the US and China obviously have been quite strained of late. Uh, you know, soon after Anthony Blinken's visit to Beijing, uh, President Biden called Xi Jinping a dictator. Clearly, China was not amused and reacted rather angrily. But despite that, the two countries have agreed to continue with their talks. Is there any reason for that to cause discomfiture to India? And do you think this might have come up in the talks between the two leaders? Well, I don't think India has ever, ever taken a stand against dialogue between countries or, you know, the relations that countries transact with each other. Those are sovereign decisions. Obviously, you know, if the US and China are talking to each other or want to stabilize their relations, well, that is between them. But if such stability brings a better situation to the region that surrounds us, so be it. I think we all benefit from it. But in terms of let, coming back, uh, you know, to, we talk of the Russia-China relationship, how Russia and China are building this confederacy, a limitless partnership. But let me tell you, as Russia gets boxed in in Ukraine, China is being given a free hand. So we need to build deterrence against China. We need to build the balance against China. So the Russia-India relationship builds some kind of balance. The US-India relationship builds a very effective balance against China. And a dialogue between US and China in order to reduce tensions 
obviously we don't want conflict and confrontation between these two very powerful countries, the world's two most powerful countries, because the fallout of that affects all of us. So, you know, it's a game that we, uh, that has to be played with a great deal of skill and deftness and foresight. And I think that is the challenge before our foreign policy makers today. Right. Now, Prime Minister Modi said in an interview to the Wall Street Journal before he left for the U.S., some people say we are neutral, but we're not neutral. We're on the side of peace. In fact, he also reiterated while addressing the U.S. Congress that this is not an era of war. But we know that India and the U.S. have divergence of views on the Ukraine war and Russia's role in it, also on India's continued Russian oil imports. But do you think the U.S. has reconciled itself to this divergence of views and sort of moved on? Do you think this may have come up in the talks between President Biden and Prime Minister Modi? Well, the divergence, as you refer to it, the divergences, as you refer to it, hasn't detracted from the strategic convergence that we share, India and the U.S., when it comes to the Indian Ocean region, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, when it comes to the deterrence of countries that are, as you said, coercive and intimidate uh, the rest of us, uh, you know, who are on the side of peace. So I think the convergences outweigh the divergences and i'd like to uh, you know really end with that sure ma'am uh, prime minister modi once again sent out a strong message to pakistan without of course naming the country saying even two decades after 9 11 and a decade after 26 11 terrorism remains a pressing challenge it's an enemy of humanity and there can be no ifs and buts in dealing with it now in the past there has been great heartburn for india over close military ties between the U.S. and Pakistan, America providing F-16s to Pakistan, for instance. Are we likely to see that equation changing now, especially given that the U.S. and NATO troops, of course, withdrew from Afghanistan almost two years ago? Well, I think the equation between the United States and Pakistan has changed completely. Uh, you, we all know the relationship that they enjoyed during the Cold War. We know uh, the relationship that they enjoyed uh, following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the way Pakistan was built up by the United States as a, as a so-called bulwark against uh, extremism and terrorism. In, but, but what happened, we know the outcome of all that happened. Pakistan is a country that has really, I think, done a lot of harm in our own region and harm to itself also because of you know its creation of this monster this frankenstein of terrorism which has caused so much suffering and uh, pillage i would say really all around so pakistan today i would say is imploding in so many ways because of its economic instability its political instability and uh, today it it's left with very few friends. And no, I mean, except for China. China is the only all-weather friend, so-called all-weather friend it has. So as far as Pakistan is concerned in the US-India relationship, our relationship with the United States is not, and let me underline that, is not hyphenated, hyphenated by Pakistan yes. in any manner. That, in fact, changed a long time ago. You're quite right about that. Uh, I want to ask you, ma'am, um, about another sensitive, shall I say, prickly issue that has come up during this visit. Now, in an interview to CNN, former U.S. President Barack Obama said, if I had a conversation with Prime Minister Modi, I would argue that if you don't protect the rights of minorities in India, there's a strong possibility that at some point India starts pulling apart. And if President Biden meets with Prime Minister Modi, then the protection of the Muslim minority in a majority Hindu India is something worth mentioning. At a press conference, Following the bilateral talks, Prime Minister Modi was asked what India will do to improve the rights of religious minorities. And he said, democracy is a part of our spirit and blood. We live and breathe democracy. It's in our constitution. And when we live and breathe democracy, there is no question of any kind of discrimination. What do you make of how this issue has been handled by the two sides? Well, I think President Biden constantly emphasized this shared, as he called it, respect for human rights shared principles of democracy, freedom, and the rule of law. So the emphasis was on shared throughout. 
that India and the United States shared these principles. They were, these were the foundational principles of their democracy and uh, also the warm bonds of family and friendship between the two countries. And you're right that Prime Minister Modi on his part talked about the democratic values that bind us together. So it was very clear that even if these the two leaders had had conversations about you know their views and their perspectives on the situations in each other's country these were conducted with adequate candor adequate frankness but behind closed doors and they were not intended to become a controversy or detract from the overall fundamental importance of building that strategic convergence between our two democracies, which are still, I would say, defined by openness and transparency and respect for constitutional principles. So that's how I would I would term it. And, uh, you know, President Biden in his remarks at the press conference talked about challenges faced by both countries, where when it came, you know, he talked, talked of these challenges in human rights or democratic values or press freedom or religious freedom or tolerance and diversity. But it was clear that, you know, these are challenges that as democracies, as young democ as a young democracy like India, that we are going to face as a part of our evolution. But that hasn't taken away from the strength, the durability and the stability of our systems and the safety and security of our populations. So so I think the United States has recognized that. And India and the United States are building that uh, relationship conscious of their democratic strengths and not democratic weaknesses. All right. Uh, final question, ma'am. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's been said that uh, H-1B uh, visa rules are going to be tweaked. I wonder if you have thoughts on that because it's, it's caused a lot of frustration amongst Indians. Also, uh, as we wrap up this conversation, what, according to you, have been the key takeaways so far from this historic state visit? Well, the key takeaways, as I see it, are, you know, the steady progress of this relationship on which we have been able to build the outcomes that we've seen from the meetings between Prime Minister Modi and President Biden from the defense, industry, and trade, and security side, you've seen conscious, very concrete outcomes. You've seen technology, emergent technology, emerging technologies becoming the heart and pillar of this partnership. It has been wonderful to see what the people-to-people -people linkages between the two countries have yielded in terms of the strength of the Indian American diaspora that have themselves contributed, in a sense, mainstreamed the India-US relationship in a manner that we have never, never seen before. And most and I think a takeaway is also the clear presence of a very trusted relationship between our two leaders. They are really, I would, you know, President Biden spoke about India becoming the United States' best friend. And I think we are on the way to achieving that. We are on the way to achieving that. And clearly, there's a lot to be said even about the personal chemistry between the two leaders. Uh, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, ma'am. Ambassador Nirupama Rao, former Foreign Secretary and former Indian Ambassador to the United States. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your time and perspective on this historic Thank you. visit. Thank you, Neha. It's been a pleasure.